Now, apart from the row over whether there should be another independence referendum, another row is brewing over which powers should be devolved and which should be reserved to the UK when Britain leaves the European Union. The presumption of the Scotland Act is that powers in areas like farming and fishing will be fully devolved, but some are arguing it would be better to have a UK single market. A little earlier, I spoke to the constitutional expert, Michael Keating, via Skype. When powers are, de are devolved back from Brussels to either London or, or Edinburgh, uh, there seems to be some question about whether the Scotland Act would have to be amended if, for example, some powers on agriculture were to rest with Westminster. What's your take on that? Yes, it would have to be, because when the provision that Scottish legislation has to conform with European legislation is taken away, these powers automatically come back to Holyrood, they're not reserved to Westminster. So either the Scotland Act would have to be changed or some other legislation would have to be put in overriding the Scotland Act. Now, would that apply if, I mean, there are certain things which there would be an argument are quite reasonable to reserve for Westminster. For example, you might want to devolve to Scotland the power over subsidies to farmers, but on the other hand, you might want common standards across the UK for farms so that uh, people can sell agricultural produce throughout the UK. There's a UK single market. For things like that, would there still have to be an amendment to the Scotland Act? There would have to be some kind of framework. It's to do with standards, but it's also to do with subsidies as well, because you'd have to have a common regime for subsidies across the UK, otherwise you'd get unfair competition. And if the UK signs a free trade agreement, whether with the EU or anybody else that covers agriculture, that would have to cover agricultural subsidies. But those frameworks could be delivered in two ways. Either the UK could lay down the law from above, or you could do what the Welsh Government has suggested, which is have a four-nation partnership and negotiation about what those common standards might be. And when it comes to subsidies, there is an argument, I suppose, that the last thing Scotland should want is food devolution, because uh, we get a disproportionate share of common agricultural policy funds. And if that were just repatriated and then barnetized, presumably Scotland could, could lose out by hundreds of millions of pounds. Well, no, let's get the Barnett formula straight. The Barnett formula says we get what we already get, and then every year thereafter, any increase or change in English expenditure is distributed according to population. So we get about 17 or 18 percent of the common agricultural policy subsidies at the moment. Under Barnett, we still get that 17 or 18 percent. If it was a per capita allocation, then we could lose out. But so far, the UK government has said nothing whatever about how it's going to distribute those monies. Uh, and of course, if Scotland had complete freedom in determining how that money was spent, as it would under the Barnett formula, then you'd have support for farmers competing with support for the NHS, education, social services and all the other priorities. And that would be a very difficult decision for the Scottish government to make. Why do you say that there would have to be a UK-wide regime for subsidies. I mean, surely you could determine subsidies, say, for hill farmers in Scotland, independent of the UK. It, it, it might lead to imbalances in terms of competition, but these wouldn't be major, would they? Well, there could be. If we were to subsidise our lamb, say, uh, and sell it in UK markets, the Welsh lamb farmers would not be happy. they say that was unfair competition. Uh, they may, the, the European Union, of course, deals with this because of its competition policy. Uh, and if we don't have European competition policy, there would have to be some kind of competition policy within the UK. It doesn't just apply to agriculture. It also applies to regional development subsidies of, of, of all sorts. In other words, we'd have to have a UK internal market if we're losing the European one. Michael Keating, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Well, the Scottish Government's Brexit Minister, Mike Russell, joins us now from... Somewhere so beautiful it makes Alex Salmon's field and stricken look positively dull. Where are you? <laughs> I'm in the Cows of Butte in the village of Colin Trive. All right. OK. Luke, let me just get your reaction to a piece of news that has come in this morning, Mike Russell. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but the Spanish Foreign Minister, uh, Alfonso Dastiz, has said this morning that Spain would not block an independent Scotland 
becoming a member of the European Union. I'll just read you what he says. He says, we don't want it, that's Scottish independence, to happen. But if it happens legally and constitutionally, we would not block it. Your, your reaction to that? That is, has been the position of the Spanish government for some considerable time. Uh, all the speculation about what the Spanish government would or wouldn't do has been wrong. That has been the position of the Spanish government. It's helpful to have it restated, but that's not actually news. Right, um, but presumably you welcome it nonetheless. I, I very much welcome it because it, it, it equates with reality. Uh, he's gone on to talk about the method of accession, and that's not quite as accurate. I think this week we heard John Kerr, the man who wrote Article 50, the former British representative in Europe, talking about the ease of, of entry into Europe were we to be outside. So there's been a lot of positive take, and what this does is it, it de-escalates the situation. It produces some reality in the situation, so then we can have a, an argument about the merits of the case, not misinformation, which has been coming from a, a range of sources. Now, Michael Keating, the constitutional expert, just told us that. I wasn't, I'm not sure if you could actually hear him, but his argument was that... I heard it, him, yes. OK, well, his point was the Scotland Act is going to have to be uh, revisited and changed. What's your view on that? I think he's right. We have been saying this for some considerable time. The way that devolution is established, uh, essentially everything is devolved except those uh, items which are reserved to Westminster. If Westminster wants to reserve new items or parts of things that devolved, that will require them to reopen the Scotland Act. Uh, we recognize that there has to be constructive, detailed negotiation now about the proposals in the Great Reform Bill. What that shouldn't be, sh about, it shouldn't be about power grabbing, it should be about how we manage to work together in order to install a, a new regime. Now, you know, that is separate from the issue of a referendum. There is work to be done because nobody wants to get to the end of two years and discover that there is a complete hiatus. So we need those detailed negotiations. And the problem we've seen with the great repeal bill white paper this week is it doesn't have enough detail. And the detail it does have is not helpful, like stuff on repatriation of powers. So I've been urging my, my colleague David Davis to say, let's sit down, let's talk in great detail about this, let's get officials working on it so we get it right. But Westminster should have known for a long time okay. that if they wanted to re-reserve matters, right. they'd have to go back to the original legislation. But in principle, you would not be amend against amending the Scotland Bill should those discussions take place and have some successful conclusion? Well, in principle, I'd be very much against amending the Scotland Bill because that would weaken devolution. And we've said for some time we think that is probably the Tory agenda. Uh, what we need is a detailed discussion of how the Great Repeal Bill can work uh, so that Scotland gets back, as Wales gets back, all the powers pertaining to devolved areas. That's yes, but, what's but, important. And sure, the, uh, Michael but, but, Keating but, mentioned the Welsh Government. We want to go along with them. Yes, but in the, let's just take the case of agriculture. There is an argument, isn't there, that on hmm. things like farming standards, we need a UK framework so that there's a UK single market so that Scottish farmers can freely sell into it. Now, that would have to be run from the UK um, at the UK level, and I can't quite see why you would be against that, but that itself might need an well, amendment to the Scotland Act. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. There are two things in there. The first is those standards will continue if the Great Repeal Bill as it will operate as it's intended to. Those standards will continue. The day after the UK is outside, those standards will be the same. So they don't need urgent changes. The second one is how do we negotiate a, a common standard and framework? We agree very strongly with the Welsh, with elements in Northern Ireland, that what you do is you uh, repatriate those powers and we all sit down together uh, and say, how can we make these work together? That replicates what happens in Europe because it's co-decision making in Europe. You have a, the Council of Ministers and decisions are made jointly. Uh, what the UK government seems to be talking about is them making the decisions. Yes, but and that would what not also, bring back what, the powers. That okay, would but take what the also, powers away. What also happens in Europe is once you have this co-determination, there is a single market framework laid down and everyone in Europe has to play by the rules. The argument is, and you heard Michael Keating there saying that, that for farming, for example, there needs to be a, a UK framework, which everyone agrees on, but obviously that would have to be managed at a UK level. Well, it would have to be managed by the four nations of the UK working together. 
it should not be imposed by the UK government and everybody just does as they're told because there are huge variations. N if you look behind me... N no, I accept that point. The point, but the point the I'm making is there would have to be a will, single will have, framework. Every person... The framework would have to be negotiated. Every single person who farms the hills behind me gets less favoured area payment. Uh, virtually nobody in England gets that payment. There are different types of payment that are required for different products and different types of farming. That's a localised decision making, but we can come together to agree frameworks. But if they are imposed, then we'll not get the type of framework that we need here, they need in Wales. Okay. That's how it right. works presently in Europe. Local no. decision making working together. What the UK government is looking at is imposition, and that's unacceptable. Uh, well, except they, they haven't made clear to you, have they? You, you say that, but they haven't said that to you. Well, well if you read, uh, I think it's section 4.4 of the Great Repeal Bill, you will see the intention is towards something called common UK frameworks. What we need to do is to discover how those work. If we are talking about repatriating powers, then we can do a great deal of work. But, but common Very UK frameworks and the kind of areas tasks. we're talking about make perfect sense, don't they? I mean, you've accepted that. Uh, you just are, want them if, negotiated if they properly. Are the go if, no, no. Well, well, I do think that's rather important that the decision-making process is the right one to get the right things happening here. Uh, we have been talking about this for months. So have the Welsh. And as the Welsh First Minister indicated today, we've been getting nowhere because the UK government okay. isn't listening. This is a, 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 a okay. version All of right. what's happening now with Gibraltar, with Scotland, with Northern Ireland, with Wales. The Prime Minister isn't listening and is uh, trying to impose. Okay. That's not acceptable. Now, apart from the Scotland Act possible amendments, the other issue that's come up this week is whether at various stages, SUO motions, uh, might, uh, legislative consent motions, might have to be passed by the Scottish Government, uh, Parliament rather, f in order for Brexit to go ahead. Have you looked at that and, and, mm -hmm. and what's your view? Well, the Secretary of State for Scotland said last week he thought he was certain there would be. David Davis said this week he didn't know. There are parts, undoubtedly, of the Great Repeal Bill, when we see the bill, because we've only got a white paper now, that will require legislative consent, because legislative consent is about altering the competencies of the Parliament or the government. And there is absolutely no doubt that that's what these do. Now, that's a discussion we need to have, how those fit into place. There will then be a great deal of what they call secondary legislation. In fact, they're talking about thousands of pieces of secondary legislation. How we get those through and how we deal with those in the time frame we have is also a big area for discussion. What we now need is constructive discussion with the UK government sitting down with us and saying, this is our options, this is how we intend to do things, let's debate and discuss this. Until we have that, then we can't make much progress. Um, OK, but... If you were to block any of those legislative consent motions, I mean, is that something you would consider doing if you don't get your permission for a referendum? And what are the implications of that? Well, uh, what we're talking about here is trying to take an enormously complex body of legislation and change it all within a two-year period. It's in nobody's interest to get that wrong. It has to be got right. What we're saying is we need the type of working relationship that will get that right. Okay. We don't right. see such much sign of it now. For the last six months, we haven't had it. Right. But J we just do briefly. need it on this matter. The referendum is, a, is a, another issue in which we also need cooperation. Just briefly, um, when I interviewed you the other day, I thought that you ruled out any referendum to be held outside a Section 30 order, and I was a sort of private initiative by the Scottish Government. Um, but five minutes after you said it, you said it, Willie Rennie, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, said you hadn't ruled it out. Had you ruled it out or not? <laughs> if we keep going back round what Willie Rennie says, we'll be here all day and it'll not make much sense. It is absolutely clear that we're going to do this legally and by the book, and I absolutely rule out any other way of doing it. All right. That's clear, I think, until it's challenged by someone. Michael Russell, Mike Russell, thank you very much indeed for joining us.